to basically lay the, the background. Um, I'm sure we, you know, we all now, it's, it's very common knowledge now that uh, uh, democracy requires legitimate elections and a fundamental element for, for elections to be seen as legitimate tools. I think a key component is what political scientists call losers consent. So the losers must accept their fates essentially. And, and losers can only accept uh, the outcome of elections if the elections are seen as credible. Um, and what constitutional designers then have to do is find ways, establish the institutional mechanisms to ensure that elections are actually seen as credible. And there are three key uh, design options. Two are quite common and one is rare. And, and, and that is what we are, we are talking about today. The first one is, is that most countries uh, generally, in the, increasingly in the constitution, but also through other legislation, establish independent electoral uh, management bodies. Uh, they, they can have different names, but their purpose is essentially to take the management of elections out of the government uh, to, to ensure credibility of elections. Um, a second element is term limits. Uh, term limits, uh, their principal purpose is to guarantee alternation of power, but they also ensure that the incumbent is withdrawn regularly from elections and that then also enables um, the credib credibility of elections. The third one, and at what we find is uh, it's, it's, it's practically rare, uh, but, but, but actually as, as fascinating is, is the practice of forcing incumbent presidents in the case of, uh, in some countries and in Bangladesh incumbent governments. It's not the case anymore. And, and we'll hear more of, from the good professor here. Um, but these essentially withdraw or they remove the incumbent president or government uh, to ensure a level playing a level field a level playing field and this has been it actually originated can almost simultaneously in Bangladesh in uh, Madagascar and Cape Verde it was first constitutionalized in Madagascar and Cape Verde uh, and subsequently in, in Bangladesh but it arose around the same time around what, um, what is often considered as the third wave of demo democratization. But in, increase, interestingly, it didn't really catch the wave. Uh, it only happened in these countries and hasn't been exported, hasn't really migrated to other parts of uh, the world. Um, and we want to know, uh, you know what, uh, why that's the case and, all, and the potential this, this re represents. Um, and naturally, the main advantage essentially is, is, is to create uh, you know, a, level, a level of credibility of the elections. Um, but at the same time, it could also create a, 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 pos a possibility of a political vacuum, like the challenge of transitions, of, of multiple, multiple transitions. Um, and so, so what we want to know today, and, and, and also what we want to discuss with the participants is, is um, why incumbents in particular, why would they accept a rule like this, or why should they accept a rule like this? That's one. Um, and, and, and secondly, what has the consequence of that been, particularly in the context of the, the in, the, in the context of Madagascar and Bangladesh, um, in the context of Cap Verde, unfortunately, we don't have um, a speaker from, from, from Cap Verde, but I'll briefly note that and then and, and pass the, the baton on to, to, to other panelists. So Cap Verde is one of the countries that is considered as a democracy in Africa. Um, it, it, is, it, is, it is a small island of the coast uh, of the western coast of the continent. Um, and, and interestingly, they have had this rule and there has not been any debate in terms of removing it or abolishing it. But at the same time, uh, it has managed to, 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 to create, a, a, in, in combination with other factors, an accepted credible electoral process. But it has, it has never witnessed a situation where the incumbent has actually lost. Uh, if, if you look at Madagascar and, and, and Bangladesh, incumbents have actually lost, and partly because of this, this requirement. Um, so I would, I would end here um, and, and, and invite first Professor Ramasey essentially to tell us the origins of the rule in, Bangla, in, in Madagascar, how it, it fared, how it was removed and came back, and why that was the case. Um, and also some of the advantages and challenges is, is the, uh, the rule has faced in, 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 in Madagascar and perhaps also some of the lessons uh, for, for countries across the world. Thank you very much and welcome Professor Ramasi. You have uh, seven minutes. Thank you, thank you for giving me the floor and thank you for uh, idea to invite me to discuss about uh, 
the case of Madagascar. So I will now share my, uh, my screen. So the, my presentation will be in uh, four parts. I will talk about the uh, conditional history of Madagascar, just, just to make a brief uh, presentation of the context, then about uh, the region of the resignation of the in incumbent. And then in the third part, I'll talk about the, what are the role of the interim president and the caretaker government, and what are the implications for, the, for Madagascar. For so first of all, what we know about Madagascar constitutional history. So there was, uh, so four republics in Madagascar and also uh, during this four republic there has been several constitution. So the first republic from 1960 to 1970. So there was a first constitution and then uh, after that republic there was a second republic with another constitution. Uh, until 1991, and then in the Third Republic from 1993 to 2009, there was uh, three constitution. So the constitution of 1992, 1998, and 2008. So it will be with the first constitution of that republic that will be that rule for the the convent who have to resign uh, before the election. And uh, now we are in the Fourth Republic with. Uh, the 2010 constitution with the same uh, rule for the incumbent president. So now the second point, what was the, the origin of the, that rule? So the, the origin of the rule was came from the, the FFKM. So the FFKM is the Council of Christian Church in Madagascar. So uh, what we have to know is the church have played an important role during the, the end of the Second Republic with the transition. So they were the main drafter of this constitution. So why did they introduce that rule for the incumbent to resign? Because uh, the FFM wanted to uh, regulate the terms and the condition of the president election. And they want to do it strictly because uh, as uh, we have seen in the past, so there was the, the Second Republic. It was uh, the Republic can be characterized with an autocratic regime. So they wanted to the president to the incumbent to resign before the election, and that was also uh, explained by uh, there was no an independent uh, electoral commission. So it was something important to have a, a fair and a credible uh, election without, uh, and also to try to avoid the state resource abuse from the, from the president and uh, also to uh, avoid some electoral manipulation. <clears throat> but we can see that a uh, few years later with the new constitution in 1998 and uh, 2007, the provision the was withdrawn from the, from the new constitution. And then it was reintroduced in uh, the new constitution for the of the Fourth Republic. So we can see in the uh, Article 46 of the, the new constitution, and it was also the same with the constitution of 1992. So they have to resign before the, the date of the campaign or, uh, or uh, with the new constitution, it was uh, 60 days before the, uh, the election. So that's happened uh, for the first time for the, the election in uh, 2018. So the president of the Republic had to resign. So it was uh, around the 7th of November. So uh, it was uh, well seen by uh, all the political uh, actors in Madagascar. So then we see that uh, when he had to resign, the president of the Senate has to uh, <clears throat> replace him as an interim president. So there had been a handover of, uh, that took place on September 12, 
2018. So the president of the Senate became the, the new president. So, but there was no change in the, the, the governance. So we can see that there was this uh, end over at the palace of the, the president. And, uh, but we have to uh, also note that the former president, so it was the president here, uh, Razonar Mapian, who uh, was beat. Uh, he really don't want to, to resign, but there was some pressure of the, the, all the political actors. And also, uh, you have to respect the constitution to, uh, to be a candidate for the, the, next, uh, the next election. And this provision is also in, in, uh, inside of the electoral the law. So all the, the president, but also uh, all person holding a political mandate and uh, who want to be candidate have to resign. It's also, it's also the same case as the members of the, the government. But what are the, the roles of the interim president? We can see that it's the same. Uh, you have the same uh, powers as the the incumbent president. So it's uh, the case is continuing the normal continuation of proceeding to be initiated before the resignation of the president of the republic. We can see that there's been no change in the government, and uh, we can say it's business uh, as usual. And there was a decision of the high court who said that he has the same uh, power without some. Uh, some little ones that he cannot change the, the government and he cannot uh, dissolve the, the National Assembly. Then, so after the election that uh, has been in uh, November in uh, 2018, so there was been a new president who was elected. So then there was uh, the transfer of the power in uh, January uh, 2019. So between the two, uh, the three uh, presidents, so the interim president, the incumbent one, and uh, the new, the elected president. So there was this that handover between the the incumbent with the interim president, and then between the new uh, president, uh, the elected one, and the former president. So what were the the main implications? So that was important for. Uh, all the political actors, but also for the citizens to have confidence in the in the process. It was important also for the credible election. And uh, as we have seen that uh, there have been a articulation of power in Madagascar and the result of the election was accepted by all the, the main actors, despite some uh, little uh, consultation, uh, some actors did not accept the result, but then they did accept it. And uh, so they, we can see that there was this handover of power. And I think it was important for, uh, for Madagascar, for the country, and for the, the credibility of the election, but also for the, for the democracy. We can see that it can be a kind of consolidation of, the, of democracy, of the democratization process. So also of the culture of uh, democracy and, uh, and the constitutionalism. So I think for now, I've, I've finished my presentation. We can have some question in this discussion to, uh, I can have some more information about uh, the case of, uh, of Madagascar. So I would like to thank you for your, your attention. Thank, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, very, very interesting. And um, um, a few points. One is that the fact that the, the Council of Church was, was the leading actor uh, in the drafting of the Constitution itself is, is quite, quite fascinating, something to explore further. Um, and, and, and obviously, as drafters, they had the, the leverage, the mandate to, to impose what they thought was relevant, considering the country's history. Um, and maybe when, when during the Q&A, you can tell us um, who supported it when it was reinstated in 2010? Who was the main sponsors of the idea for it to be to come back? And were there any actors that resisted it? Maybe you can tell us later uh, about that. Um, and another really interesting aspect is that the electoral law has actually extended the application of the rule to anyone, not just the incumbent president, anyone who wants to run for the presidency or other offices 
are required to resign, which is very much like in, in, in Cape Verde as well. And in, in, Cape, in Cape Verde, it has been stable. Uh, and there is even a, a few cases. So that's, that's also very, very, very interesting. Uh, also good to know that the interim president actually has full powers. The, the, the person has all the powers that the presidency offers, which obviously avoids mm -hmm. uh, problems of um, gaps uh, in, in, in terms of, in terms of the, the political process. Um, very interesting points. Um, so we'd like to, 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 to thank you again. Um, and I'll call on uh, Professor Redwanul to tell us another really interesting uh, st story as well, uh, focused primarily on the origins and, and the consequences and, and where a country is today uh, in terms of, in terms of um, the, uh, the applicab applicability of the rule. Thank you and welcome, Professor. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to begin once again by thanking uh, International Idea, uh, especially Dr. Adam Ababe, uh, for inviting me. Uh, so it's a very little time allocated. Uh, I'll try, but I'm afraid I might over, over, overtake some more time. Probably uh, I'll finish uh, by uh, 10 minutes, not, not more than that. So let me share my uh, presentation slides here but I'll be going very quickly. Um, uh, so uh, a little bit about Bangladesh. Bangladesh became an independent nation uh, in 1971, March, and uh, the independence is based on a general election in the then Pakistani state, which was the first election ever in Pakistan after its independence from the British in 1947. This is very ironic. Uh, then uh, the constitution of Bangladesh came into force on 16th of December 1972. And under the constitution, the first ever elections under the constitution or in March 1973. At that time, Bangladesh didn't have enough number of political oppositions or a major opposition party. It was the Bangladesh Awami League that spearheaded the independence, and that was the major party for the 1973 elections. So, but by now, uh, Bangladesh is basically a bipartisan parliamentary parliamentary system. And then uh, Bangladesh, uh, Bangladesh avoided or Bangladesh uh, abdicated parliamentary system in 1975 through a constitutional amendment. Uh, and it, uh, it transited to autocracy, to one party presidentialism. Uh, this is very interesting. Uh, because uh, that was uh, introduced by the very political party that uh, led the country to independence. And as a consequence, uh, the father of the nation was brutally assassinated in 1975. And since then, and down to 1990, there was no democracy in Bangladesh. Bangladesh uh, transited to uh, uh, democracy in 1991 through an to a general election in February 1991. And this election, uh, which uh, the background paper just uh, mentions, uh, was a kind of caretaker government, the thing we are discussing today. But uh, for, the, for, the, or for, for the proper perspective of a caretaker government, I would distinguish it from the caretaker government that was constitutionalized in 1996. Uh, it was indeed a, a deal between uh, political parties. In 1990, 1990 uh, it was an autocratic military ruler who was in power. And the major two political parties, Bangladesh Awami League and Bangladesh Nationalist Parties, are against the uh, uh, military dictator. So they didn't want to have an election under the then uh, ruler or military dictator. So there was a kind of deal, and because of that deal, it was possible to hold an election under the leadership of the then Chief Justice of Bangladesh. So 
And that's, uh, that brings Bangladesh to democracy once again. And in that election, 1991, February, uh, Bangladesh Nationalist Party won the election and they transited to parliamentary democracy through a political consensus. However, uh, now uh, uh, we got a context for the introduction of the caretaker government. I would uh, briefly call it a CTG. Uh, during the first regime of BNB in 1994, there was a crisis uh, over the holding of an election, by election, in 1994. So the party came to power in 1991 through a successful and free and fair election. And in 1994, BNP wanted to manipulate uh, or corrupt the electoral system to gain uh, incumbency uh, advantage. And the opposition, our Milik, initiated a huge protest, uh, often, often, often combined with bloodshed and, and, and severe uh, political demonstrations of severe form. And uh, it was a 22 months uh, long revolution or struggle for the introduction of a neutral or a political caretaker government. And at one point, uh, the next election was due in 1996. Then, uh, next election was due in 1996, and 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 uh, a, an election was held that was a one-party election because the opposition boycotted because the caretaker government system was not institutionalized in the constitution. However, that uh, election or the government that came from the election was a very short government. It was only for 15 days. And the ruling BNP party ultimately gave in to the demand of, of the political oppositions. And there were three major parties, our main league, Datio party that was uh, in power in 1990, and a Jamati Islami party, which is a pre-independence political party. And uh, the BNP party introduced the nine, introduced the 13th amendment to the constitution. <clears throat> and we all know that uh, this caretaker government system uh, was an, a political government system, but it had its own defects because the major political parties are out of the parliament when the 13th amendment was passed. So the BNP could do its manipulation over the formation of the government. One defect was the over, uh, over empowerment of the president. Anyway, uh, the another defect was the choice of the retired chief justice in, in chronological order. Uh, the most recent was to be the first choice uh, is another defect because it had a toll on independence of judiciary. However, under the caretaker government system that was introduced in 1996, there were several elections in 1996, uh, in 2001, and in 2008. However, in, the, in between, the election was due in 2006, and that election could not be held because the then BNP ruling party wanted to manipulate the caretaker government system that it introduced in 1996 by increasing the retiring age of the Supreme Court judges. So one particular chief justice was in mind, and uh, that chief justice was a brother-in-law of a killer of the father of nation, father of the nation. And the father of the nation is the father of current prime minister, Ms. Sheikh Hasina. So there's a kind of personal and uh, emotional issue embedded into the politics. So because of that, um, our Malik said that, no, we won't go for election even under the Kyotaka government if that is chaired by the recent retired chief justice. And ultimately, no elections are held. And as of that, as a matter of that, the military intervened and there was an, a political government for two years, 2007 and eight. However, that was the caretaker government indeed, but it extended its constitutional tenure of three months until two years. Then the next election came in 2008. 
and the next election was i mean the next election was due in 2014 but in the meantime uh, i'll be very brief here in 2010 the supreme court of bangladesh in a very short order of three sentences um, less than 100 words declared that the caretaker government was unconstitutional it was a short order then it, it, it came in 2010 but uh, immediately after that when the um, um, the full judgment was due wasn't yet issued or handed or handed down the the incumbent government this time this is bangladesh our league it is the bangladesh our league which demanded the introduction of caretaker government and in the meantime, the our league introduced 15 amendment to the parliament, and it was tabled before parliament the day on on the day of 25th of June 2011, and it was passed uh, the same day. However, there was a committee, special uh, parliamentary standing committee, formed to look into the details of the 15th amendment. But the point I want to make here is that the 15th Amendment uh, Special Committee, uh, you can see here, um, uh, it acted from 29 July 2010 to uh, May 28, 2011. And it, it started before the court declared non party category government unconstitutional. Now, uh, it, it acted for about a year or more than that. However, uh, it just dealt with the abolition of the caretaker government only for one month. And toward the tenure of the commission, special committee, they favored the retention of the caretaker government. And they finalized their uh, report on May 28, 2011. But unfortunately, they met the incumbent prime minister, Sheikh Hasina on 29th May 2011 and they submitted their final report on 30th June 2011 and in that report within one day they changed their position recommending abolition of the caretaker government and immediately after that the caretaker government system was abolished or taken off the constitution to the 15th amendment so now let me uh, now straightforwardly go to the uh, conclusion because I have taken my time. Uh, the non-party caretaker government was an innovative constitutional design and Bangladesh was the pioneer. Uh, I have seen the useful comparison between Madagascar and uh, uh, Cape Verde and Bangladesh. But in 1996, Bangladesh was unique and it was unlike the caretaker government system introduced either in Madagascar or in Cape Verde uh, because it's uh, very much constitutional. Uh, it's not a constitutional political deal. Uh, there are stark dissimilarities in context between the introduction and the abolition of the caretaker government system. The introduction of the caretaker government system was based on a wide political consensus but its abolition was based on a whimsical political decision by the ruling Awami League, which had an overwhelming majority in parliament to amend the constitution. And uh, it, 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 uh, it came to power by taking the benefit of a caretaker government, which it wanted to abolish. Then, Bangladesh elections under the ruling political party show that the regime tends to corrupt the system and the administration for gaining incumbency advantage. If we uh, look at the outcome and performance of the caretaker government system, we would see that every single time there is an alteration of uh, incumbent party. So in 1996, uh, 1991, in, in the caretaker government system, it was BNP. In 1996 election, it was Awami League that won. In 2001 election, it was again BNP. And in 2008 election, it was again our mini. So four times there was alteration of power between the two major parties. And 
But as a consequence, we now see this. Uh, the system was withdrawn in 2011, and there was an election in 2014, which was boycotted by all major political parties. So the 2014 election was under a party government, and it was a one-party election. Then the next and the latest election was in 2018, January. And the boycotting major political parties joined the election, but the election was a doctored election, engineered election, is hugely rigged election. And uh, honestly, the votes were cast the night before the election day. As a result, out of 300 general parliamentary seats, the Awami League got 293, and the seven seats went to BNP and its allies. So uh, the point is that, I mean, uh, because of the withdrawal of the non-party political government system, the country has uh, embraced uh, unconstitutionalism or elected uh, autocracy once again. Now, uh, constitutional innovation uh, to tame the incumbency advantage, in my opinion, uh, and in the context of Bangladesh, uh, where democracy is fragile and the political parties do not trust each another, each other, is not only a, not only a constitutional institution, it is also a constitutional imperative. It is needed for the consolidation of democracy, for the alteration of power between and among all parties that exist in a constitutional democracy. So uh, thank you very much for patient hearing, and I look forward to be interacting with the audience in the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Hoek, um, for a particularly interesting presentation, especially as you refer to the political circumstances that led to both the introduction and the abolition of the caretaker government. I wonder also about the prospects for reintroduction of this caretaker government um, policy, which will be really interesting to discuss later on. Um, but now I see that uh, Professor Gabriel Negreto has joined us uh, from the Catholic University of Chile. Um, we're very happy that uh, that you joined. There were some misunderstandings as to the time, uh, but we're really glad that you could make it. Uh, Professor Negreto, as I said before, will be sharing with us some reflections uh, regarding Latin America and strategies um, implemented in that continent precisely to have uh, credible elections. Um, Gabriel, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kimana. Uh... Thank you for the invitation uh, to Adem, to Kimana, to ID International. Um, okay, um, let me start very briefly to um, portray the, the landscape of the issue of, uh, a, a, of presidential election and uh, incumbent uh, president's advantage in Latin America. Uh, first of all, as you probably know, the typical mechanism to reduce the advantage of incumbent executives in Latin America since the 19th century has been the prescription of consecutive reelection. Uh, reelection was usually allowed, but only after one term of, of, of office. That was the, the, the typical uh, re uh, presidential reelection rule, that is alternate reelection. Now, this mechanism was criticized and subject to revision after the latest expansion of democracy in the region, particularly since the early 90s. Uh, the main argument has been that because uh, that, that with the relationship between presidents and voters, and that it limits the use of elections as an instance of accountability. Uh, of course, the debate, as I will argue, has been affected by partisan self-interest because it was mostly promoted by incumbent executives and their comparisons. Um, there has been a clear trend toward the relaxation of term limits since 1993, <clears throat> with some occasional reversals uh, to the opposite direction. As of today, we have eight out of 18 country constitutions in LA, in Latin America, that enable consecutive election, um, in most cases after one term, in five cases, and a few 
three cases without limit. Now note that those cases that allow uh, presidential election without any limit, such as Nicaragua, Venezuela, and um, very recently Honduras are all cases of either non-democratic regimes or deeply flawed democracies as Honduras. Um, among those that do not allow consecutive election of, of executives, six allow reelection after one or two terms and only four have an absolute prescription of reelection. So just to be clear, as of today, um, most presidential reelection regimes in Latin America um, restrict consecutive reelection, right? Some allow reelection after one or two terms out of office, some create an absolute prescription, right? Like Guatemala, like Mexico, um, or like Paraguay uh, currently. Um, there has been no debate uh, on mechanisms such as the one that we are uh, discussing today. Um, at least, I mean, certainly not uh, in, in the political arena, there has been some academic debate about the need to focus more on the advantage on the incumbents rather than on restrictions to reelection per se. Uh, it has been proposed, for instance, in a recent paper by Jose Chebu and Medina, that uh, it would be better to focus on strict regulations on uh, campaign finance and procedures, you know, equitable distribution of public funds to be used in, polit in political and electoral campaigns in order to reduce barriers uh, to entry into electoral competition, free access to media, and so on and so forth. There is uh, um, regulations that would limit the advantage without restricting the incumbent to effectively be uh, able to run for one consecutive term. Um, now, the point here is that in Latin America, the main problem is not really the advantage of incumbents once they are allowed to be reelected. The main political and constitutional problem that we face in Latin America is the partisan manipulation of the legal system to extend or remove term limits by incumbents while they're in office and the violation of the commitment to observe one term extensions once they achieve that reform. So now let me, let me show you very briefly this um, this uh, table that will illustrate my point. Um, can I share Kimana? Yes, of course, yes. Okay. Um, so if you see here, we have had since 1978, 17 reforms, legal reforms, right? Either by new constitutions, by the enactment of new constitutions, by constitutional amendments, or by judicial interpretation. All of them um, allowed executives to be reelected for one or more consecutive terms, usually just one more term um, after the reform, and they promoted this reform while in office. That has been the main political problem because these reforms are deeply controversial. They have led to polarization, and um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, they usually open the possibility that these uh, reforms, once enacted, particularly once they allow, when they allow uh, just one term extension, they will not stick, as it happened in cases like Bolivia, uh, Ecuador, and most notoriously in Venezuela. Uh, so here I, 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 I illustrate uh, the different types of legal reform by a new constitution in five cases, constitutional amendment in seven, judicial interpretation in five. As you can see in the last column, 12 of those reforms, that is 70% of, of the 17 reforms, uh, effectively led the incumbent to be reelected. That just confirms a trend right? Uh, everywhere, 
whenever presidents, inc the incumbent president is allowed to be reelected, he or she usually gets reelected uh, above 70% of the time that varies uh, for time periods and you know, depending on their, whether there was an emergency or not, but the rate is high. And that's exactly what is called uh, incumbent advantage. But um, as I said, I don't think that the main political problem that we have in Latin America right now is to reduce the advantage so much as how to uh, avoid the partisan use of the constitution, the manipulation of the legal system, the cooptation of the judiciary, most of all, in order to interpret term limits in a way that benefit incumbents. That's the main, the main, the main issue. Uh, and why I, I'm saying this uh, also because we do have regulations of the type you know uh, that I mentioned before, like for instance, Mexico. Mexico has um, an absolute prescription of, of presidential election that has been you know um, enforced since the uh, since the Mexican Revolution, uh, and there are very very strict regulations in order to reduce the advantage, not of the incumbent, because the incumbent cannot run for consecutive relation. But in, or, in order to prevent the incumbent president to favor, you know, to bias the election in support of the candidate of the president's party. Very strict regulation that really reduce the advantage of incumbent, even if the president were allowed to be reelected. And we have such regulations in many places. You know, Mexico is a typical case because Mexico has, at least until now, let's see, because now the Electoral Commission is under heavy attack by the government, but the Electoral Commission in Mexico is really strong, is really independent, and it really provides a, a strong sense of impartiality and accountability. Um, now we have, you know, strong regulations in, in many other Latin American countries about, you know, incumbents not, uh, not being allowed to, um, um, you know, uh, to do uh, certain actions 60 uh, days or 30 days before the election to promote, uh, you know, uh, new uh, public works uh, to, uh, you know, uh, get involved in, 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 in the media, uh, you know, many regulations. Now, the problem is, of course, that those regulations sometimes are not enforced, right? That, that is true. But yet, as I will say, you know, as I said before, I don't think, at least until now, that the main problem is a concern with the advantage. The concern is the, uh, how to prevent the manipulation of the legal system. So, um, in my view, and I think, um, I was invited to 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 comment on this and to bring a Latin America a Latin American perspective. Um, I think that the caretaker government mechanism is very interesting, um, uh, but I find it intriguing. Um, again, you know, from my perspective, uh, and and I have some questions here. You know, um, well, first of all, it, it seems to me that. Um, the mechanism will be either unnecessary under the right conditions, and it will be useless under the wrong conditions. That is, it seems to me to be unnecessary if there are other mechanisms that exist on the one hand and are effectively enforced on the other, such as you know, uh, independent electoral commissions, uh, strict regulations about the use of uh, of the media during campaigns, uh, uh, public funding, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so it will be unnecessary because if those mechanisms exist and, and they are enforced, then incumbents will have an, an advantage, a natural one, as I will argue now, but it will be reduced. Now, if the conditions are not, uh, 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 you know, uh, as, as such, if conditions are wrong, that is, if you don't have those mechanisms or if there is an independent electoral commission or a strict regulations about the use of, of public funding or access to the media and those conditions, those regulations are, are, are violated or, or not enforced, then 
I don't think that the caretaker government mechanism will do much to um, you know, solve the problem and reduce the advantage. So that will be my first comment, you know, whether this mechanism will do something um, extra if other conditions are uh, good or if other conditions are bad. Um, then, um, you know, I think it, 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 um, it, it is not clear how this mechanism would work when the distribution of electoral and institutional support heavily favors the incumbent, right? Because if the incumbent resigns 60 days before the election and then the government is handed over to, uh, uh, to a caretaker team, um, still, you know, the chair of the Senate, the president of the assembly could be very well you know, a member of his or her own party. So would the, why would that reduce really the advantage, you know? Uh, and third, um, you know, these mechanisms, and in general, I would say no mechanism that intends to reduce the advantage um, when it comes from the manipulation of the legal system or from the abuse of the legal system will prevent you know, the natural advantage that exists whenever executives are allowed to uh, run for, re for consecutive relation, which is the bias that comes from uh, the risk aversion of voters. So in that sense, um, you know, uh, I think that no mechanism can prevent that, right? So if you had a government that was very successful in handling a crisis, a pandemic, say, given the current situation, uh, and then um, you know, the, the, the government resigns beforehand and then a caretaker government handles the election, um, you know, the advantage will still be there. I mean, the, this caretaker government mechanism will do nothing to prevent it. Um, but again, and I will finish with this, if it's aimed at preventing illegal manipulation or the abuse of the legal system, you know, pressures of the, over the judicial, pressures over the electoral commission, I'm not exactly clear about how um, the caretaker government will um, address this problem, unless of course, the political system is so plural and so fragmented that you know uh, nobody can really manipulate the system. You know nobody controls any any of the safeguards for the credibility of elections. But then the mechanism will not be necessary, in my opinion. So these are my uh, devil advocates' comments about about the mechanism. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor. And these are exactly the points that uh, we wanna we wanna uh, we want to understand. Um, so, qu quick points. Um, I think so. The, 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 there are two ideas, um, and I'll I'll pass on the, the into the panelists. I think um, what what uh, Professor Negreto is speaking about is if you consider it as an alternative uh, to what are common what common um, practices, then it may face the same challenge, maybe even worse. Uh, challenge for, for its effectiveness, uh, but we could also consider a possibility of it as being complementary um, to, to, to the approach that, that, exists, that exists today. Um, and it, particularly if you look at, for instance, Cape Verde and Madagascar, it is actually there, uh, you know, initially as an alternative, as Professor Ramase said in Madagascar, there was no independent electoral commission. So the resignation was at the time at least seen as one way. But subsequently, the Electoral Commission was actually established. So, so now they exist um, um, together simultaneously. Um, so I think this, this is like uh, whether it can be an alternative or a complement. If it's a complement, does it really add value? Uh, that, these are the two things. Um, and the question about it being unnecessary under the right situations and useless under the wrong situations, uh, it, very interesting. And I'm sure uh, Professor Christina Murray, she is here. Uh, she says the same things about force branch institutions and, and other institutional arrangements in general, um, that you can have good institutions. If things work, you really don't need them. 
but if things do not work, they are very unlikely to actually de deliver. Um, so this is a challenge that uh, not just a caretaker government, but other institutional arrangements uh, could, could, could face. Uh, but thank you very much for getting us to think more and also for exposing us to the, the main alternatives uh, that Latin America has resorted to. Um, so I think now we can uh, thank you very much for, for your patience again, the participants. Um, so I don't know, Sharon, can we make all of them panelists uh, with one go or should we call them um, so that they can speak as we call them or should we uh, identify and go ahead as such? Um, it will, I have to do it one by one. So maybe, okay. yeah, you could start with one and I'll get going. <laughs> okay, uh, perfect. So we have a few questions in the Q&A. Uh, most of them have been addressed. Um, but if any of the questions have not been sufficiently addressed, please uh, either raise your, your hands and we can come back to it. Uh, but for now, I would go to Professor Sujit Chaudhry uh, to, to ask his questions. Please go ahead, unmute yourself and go ahead. Uh, and also Anna, after, after, after Sujit, Anna, uh, Anna can go. Thank you. Um, it's good to see everybody. Apologize with my home garb, but uh, I'm just having my coffee, but it's very, it's very nice to see everybody. So I have a question about um, so the idea of term limits in parliamentary systems. And so the I and so here's the here's the intuition. Uh, so the intuition is that there's a bit of a there, there's some ways in which the system the, the different families of, of systems um, approach the problem of incumbent advantage or can approach them in the same way, right? So the idea of resignation and caretakers conceptually could fit with both types of systems. Um, independent election systems could fit. Um, caretaker conventions, uh, perhaps judicially enforced, could fit with both systems. Okay, um, but then, the, but the term limit idea seems to be uniquely presidential. We don't think about them in the parliamentary context. But as we know, and I think the, you know, um, Adam and Kanan and others will know. I think it was in Armenia, right? There've been there've been basically there've been debates about or attempts to circumvent term limits by. Um, changing from a presidential to a parliamentary system. And basically there's no practice of term limits in parliamentary systems. As we know, sometimes people can be prime ministers for a very long time. And so the, so the question I have to the panelists, and in particular, I'm pointing to um, you know, Ridwan and also uh, Adam, who are both from parliamentary democracies or parliamentary systems at least, is can we think about can you think, is there a way to translate the idea of the term limit um, into a parliamentary system? And what would it look like? How can we begin to think about what it would be, you know? And, uh, and then related to that is the issue of um, the, the connection between, uh, in, you know, rules in, of internal party democracy and the constitutional structure, right? Um, because do they have to align in some way? So, and, and so I'll give you an example, not from a presidential, not from a parliamentary system, but from a semi-presidential system. So when Putin ran out of terms, he became prime minister, okay? And then the constitution, and then he kind of came back as president, you know? And to me, when I saw that, I always thought, well, listen, if the, if the, if the, the party constitution was governed by the constitution, that wouldn't have been allowed to happen in some way. There seemed to be some, he hid in the party, you know? And, uh, and so I, I guess that, that's the follow-up question. So, so that's, the, that's the point I'd like to put out. Thank you. Oh, and Christina has said something. Botswana has maybe introduced term limits and South Africa is parliamentary and has a term limited head of, off, head of executive. Okay, so. so th thank you very much, Sujit. Um, I'll, I'll allow in red one to speak. Um, and then there's a few, qu a few uh, um, answers, like some, of, some, some answers to your questions. Uh, on the on the chat, so you can you can follow that, but we'll we'll come back to it. Uh, please go ahead, uh, Professor. Um, thank you, uh, Shujit. Very interesting uh, uh, proposition or uh, question. Uh, as you have already said, that there is no example of term limit in a parliamentary system. Um, uh, I don't think uh, that there is a point or there is any uh, any sort of idea of introducing that into a parliamentary system like Bangladesh, uh, it will not actually 
actually uh, work. So let's take the example of Myanmar. Uh, so when Myanmar transited to democracy and uh, and the constitution, the military constitution, debarred uh, Aung San Suu Kyi uh, from becoming the prime minister or the head of the government. So, uh, so there was a titular president, but actually it was uh, Aung San Suu Kyi who was the head of the government. So something like this uh, could happen uh, if we want to impose term limits in a parliamentary democracy. But uh, the function uh, of the term limit in a parliamentary democracy uh, is done by uh, the caretaker government system. Uh, so it's not written in the system that uh, the, the, the prime minister cannot uh, repeat next time in the election, but because of the fairness and the transparency and the, and the, and, and the processed uh, independence of the of the government as well as the election commission uh, make it guarantee that uh, uh, elections are free and fair. So if elections are free and fair, depending on the performance of the party government that was there before the election, so I mean the prime minister or the cabinet will either return uh, to, to the house uh, or will not return to the house. So uh, that's the kind of mechanism to prevent uh, I mean, uh, reputation of terms, uh, provided that uh, there are uh, popular uh, disapproval. So uh, this is one thing, um, uh, because uh, in, 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 the, in the special context of Bangladesh, I, I support the caretaker government system. I do not see any alternative to the caretaker government system until for many, many years. Uh, that's proven uh, in case of Bangladesh, uh, because Bangladesh is now a mixed, uh, uh, government system and it's uh, uh, it, it's an elected autocracy and we, we we have the same government since 2009 January and we don't have any predictable uh, uh, calculation of the change of government in the near future uh, uh, so anyway uh, this is my first intervention and secondly uh, the connection between the the party rules or relating to election of the leadership as well as the conduct of elections and the constitution. Uh, that would be fantastic. I mean, if a constitution, uh, even despite the risk of redundancy, uh, sorry, risk of abundance uh, of constitutional text, uh, it could be wonderful if a constitution could detail some basic rules about the party management, about the political party management. Uh, Bangladesh constitution is one of the many constitutions in the world which does not say a single word about the political parties that basically run the government. Uh, apart from defining a political party, saying that a political party would be a party uh, for political purposes and, and, and whose formation and, and the governance would be regulated by the law. So uh, anyway, so we do not have any, anything like this. And because of that, I mean, we have severe form of party manipulation uh, in Bangladesh. So it's a kind of dynasty party. Uh, say, for example, uh, Bangladesh basically uh, has got multi parties uh, since 1991. So after 20 years of independence. And for this period, firstly, we had only one major party, our League. And then we had military governments. So the second party, Bangladesh Nationalist Party, came into being during one of the military government regimes. But it became a democratically elected party in 1991. So we have a very short history of the culture of political parties either. So thank you. Th th thank you very much, um, uh, Professor. Um, so good, good point, Sujit. Um, I think we got a few answers already. So term limits are not as rare as we think, even in parliamentary systems. Um, a lot of people, particularly in Africa, a lot of people consider South Africa and Botswana as presidential because the, the head of the executive is called the president. Um, but they are actually in practice uh, parliamentary. And um, I, I'm not exactly sure which countries, but in the Caribbean as well, some of the, the parliamentary countries have term limits. 
but it's true that in the countries in Western Europe where parliamentary systems are common, um, it doesn't, at least it doesn't exist um, as at, at, at the moment. And of course, um, you know, the, the challenge they say, if you are in a parliamentary system, you can be removed tomorrow, right? You have no guaranteed terms. And, and, and that's why if you also on top of your daily uh, vulnerability, if they have put a limitation on you in terms of how many terms you can serve, that is a, a, it's like a dual limitation. Um, but in the presidential systems, on the other hand, you are guaranteed a, a few years, but then you have term limits. So it's seen as a compromise. But again, I think, um, you know, there is really no, uh, there is nothing inherently uh, against term limits, even in parliamentary systems, I think. Um, and even in, in the context of Bangladesh, we could, if we think of it not as alt alternatives, but as potential complementary ar arrangements, um, we could find a way to, to get them uh, going together. Um, so um, is there anyone with, with a question? Or was it so clear that we don't need to ask any questions? And of course, um, um, Professor Amase, Professor Negreto, if you would like to, to come in, please go ahead. And even for those who raised questions in the Q&A, if you need um, a bit more explanation, um, we, we, you'll be very welcome. So just did you um, raise your, your, your hands again or was this? I did because I didn't want there to be an uncomfortable silence. So I actually have a, I have a question for Gabriel. Um, if that, but I don't want to jump the queue if there's no, someone else. Go ahead because Gabriel actually wants to speak as well, I think. So maybe he can address it together. Okay, so uh, so Gabriel, my question is about these um, Latin American judgments. So I'm thinking about Nicaragua, but there's others and Ecuador, where the courts have been abolishing term limits uh, on the basis that they either deny they're unconstitutional by infringing popular sovereignty or the democratic rights of the actual president. And and what I'm what I'm I'm wondering is what do you what I'm wondering is is there a way to is there any way to check that because that's quite unexpected. You know, and it's the exact obverse of what we saw in Colombia with Uribe, of course, right? And I'm just, and it's a bit of a, it sort of, it really raises in my question, uh, in my mind, the, the limitations of courts um, as potentially hedges um, against executive aggrandizement. So I'm just wondering if you could speak to that in particular. Oh, thanks, Sujit. Um, yes, yes. Uh, there are some perplexing. Uh, rulings in the last uh, you know 10 years in latin america regarding term limits that is rulings by constitutional courts or or, or constitutional um uh, justices uh and and as you said yes uh in the in some cases you know like in costa rica uh, the the decision in 2003 of the um constitutional court to abolish the term, the, the prescription on, on, on reelection because it was against the uh, sovereign decision made in 1949 uh, kind of makes sense. It, 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 it fits within the general logic of the constituent power, if, we, if you will, doctrine and, and within the limits of a constitutional democracy, um, even if you might not agree with the constituent, constituent power doctrine, but it, it kind of makes se made sense because uh, what it said is that uh, the reform made in the 60s transgressed the decision in 1949 when the constitution was enacted to allow the reelection of, of presidents after two terms out of office. Now, this stands in contrast to what um, you know, to what the uh, Constitutional Court decided in Nicaragua. Because in Nicaragua, there was uh, a, a decision uh, in, 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 um, in, 1980, in 1987 uh, to, um, you know, to, yeah, well, they, they kind of imitated the idea but the fact is that in Nicaragua, there was an agreement by the two main parties at the time to revise you know, the 1987 constitution in order to restrict the relation, to the, 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 the relation of the president. 
that is to uh, allow it only after one term of, out of office. And it also declared that this was against, um, uh, you know, the, the decision made in 1988, um, 1987, sorry. Uh, now, I, I, I was confused, sorry. The, the, the case of Nicaragua is similar in form to the case of Costa Rica. Uh, the case that really, really, uh, it's it's odd and 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 ask the question that uh, then brings to the question that you uh, asked uh, Sujit is the case of Bolivia, because in Bolivia the constitution of two thousand nine restricted the election of the president to only one term, then the president failed to get uh, an amendment passed by a popular referendum, and uh, still the constitutional court declared that the restriction was against um, not the sovereign power expressed in the uh, 2009 constitution, but it was against a uh, human rights treaty signed by Bolivia, in particular, the uh, Costa Rica uh, human rights treaty. So uh, yeah, the case of Bolivia shows you that, uh, you know, I don't think there is any possible uh, limit to this kind of outcomes by constitutional judges that are either strategic or co-opted by the regime, you know, as it was the case in Bolivia. Um, in a recent research that I have done on, 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 uh, on, on executive election reforms, what I find is that what really matters and what really makes a difference you know, to understand why in some countries uh, presidents abide by the term limits under which they were elected or uh, why they abide or are unable to uh, lift, you know, uh, the term limits uh, that, that exist uh, is related to institutional legacies. That is, only in those countries where, you know, restrictions on executive election have been enforced, uh, have been uh, effectively implemented and enforced for long periods of time is where you find that either reforms are not being proposed in order to extend or lift term limits, or if they are proposed, they fail. Um, so, and that's what happens when you make a contrast between Colombia where the constitutional court finally said, you know, more than uh, a one-term extension will be a transgression of the basic structure of the 1991 constitution and the case in Ecuador, you know, where the Supreme Court said that uh, an indefinite reelection in 2015 was okay and was, um, um, was uh, congruent with uh, the existing constitution. And I think that a lot is explained by the fact that in Ecuador, uh, there was a, 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 a long tradition of very weak uh, constraints on, exec on the executive, whereas in Colombia, in spite of the rise of Uribe, you know, uh, 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 president with, with authoritarian inclinations, um, uh, even a populist discourse and so on, uh, in fact, was unable to push through uh, this second reform. Um, so uh, I think that legacies matter a lot. And in Latin America in particular, you find that these legacies are very diverse, right? Um, and that explains, I think, why we find few cases with uh, unlimited reelection in Nicaragua, uh, in, 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 in Bolivia, um, uh, and uh, in Venezuela, and we have cases where no, nobody has ever proposed, you know, a reform, not even to extend for one more term, you know, uh, term limits, like in Chile, you know, um, or in Uruguay, you know, never. I mean, even in the case of uh, Tabaré Vázquez, a very popular president, uh, his co-partisans in 2008 proposed, you know, to reform the constitution, uh, in order to, uh, for the president to get reelected, he had approval rates above 80% and he himself, you know, uh, rejected the proposal. Uh, and I think that a strong tradition of, 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 of restrictions on the executive that were enforced over time explains that. 
Uh, now, I had one question, Adam, before. Uh, well, not one question, one comment, in fact, about uh, about this uh, this uh, divergence between you know presidential and parliamentary systems in, in as regards uh, uh, executive term limits, uh, and, and I think it, it, many people are starting to question this, you know, uh, more and more, uh, but. The historical reasons are very clear, you know, and 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 in presidential systems, the reason why term limits became so important and not so much in parliamentary systems is that in presidential system power is personalized, you know, uh, in the executive, which is you know a unipersonal office, basically, um, you know, so even. Even under democratic conditions, you know, um, people, constitutional design has always seen the need for some sort of restriction and, and the fact that, you know, the continuity of precedents will lead to corruption, manipulation, and of course, you know, uh, uh, the biasing of election in favor of the incumbent uh, uh, over time. Now, but this is questionable, of, is questionable, of course, in parliamentary system where power is also personalized, you know, sometimes. And uh, um, so I think it's an intriguing question for which we have historical answers, but, uh, but I think this is a, a debate that might probably become more important, you know, yeah. in, the, yeah. in the next uh, few years. Uh, th th thank you very much, uh, Professor. I see Christina has raised uh, her, her arm, her hands. Um, Maybe um, I'm going to abuse my position and bring in uh, Professor Ramasse, and maybe you can go after that question, Christina, if you don't mind. Professor Ramasse, can, can you tell us the context within which the rule was reinstated in 2010? Uh, so in 91, it was the Council of Church. In 2010, who was pushing for it and whether anyone pushing against it? Uh, but before you answer, I'm going to give Christina a chance. Maybe the question also uh, is for you. Please go ahead, Christina. I know. Well, I, I don't know that my question is quite related to that. But I was, I suppose I'll pick up, Adam, on what you said right at the beginning, that um, I'm a bit of a cynic on constitutional design. And that is true. Um, I really don't know how much we can do through design. But um, I suppose in this context, I would go for a kind of belts and braces approach and say whatever you can get is worth trying. Because when we draft a constitution, we really don't know how it's going to play out. So that would mean term limits um, and possibly caretaker governments, um, if you can get it. And um, one of the speakers I know mentioned party regulation. Um, I mean, we know that's often manipulated. But again, I think these things all bring things that finally become discussed in the public. So it brings issues out into the open, having these things, even if they don't work. So that's sort of... Um, so a bit of background of where I would come from, but in this caretaker government thing, there's clearly resistance to it. And I mean, both these stories tell that, both the Madagascar and the Bangladesh story tell it for obvious reasons. And in the handful of cases in which I've been involved in which we've sort of tried to get a caretaker government accepted, it's been resisted. Um, so they're a hard sell, as Adam, you already have indicated. Um, which made me think, especially triggered a little bit by a comment Sujit made, you know, should we not be looking a little bit more at breaking them down and all the bits? So there's quite a, I think Sujit, and you'll know this and other people from Westminster systems will know this better than I do. There's quite a, um, an entrenched um, convention of a limited level of caretaker government prior to elections um, in Westminster systems. Same government is in place, but what it can do is theoretically restricted. So one of the things, and in fact, we tried this when we were in Fiji, that one might think of is try to break down the elements of a caretaker government and try and get one or another, as many as you can, possibly into a system. And that would go to what appointments can be made before an election, what, um, um, what budgetary things can be done for election? The South African government tried to build lots of houses for people in, you know, and all that stuff that we're all very familiar with. Um, are there ways of doing that? It's not a solution to incumbents. It's not going to necessarily change the election outcome, but it may contribute in a tiny way 
to leveling playing fields. And it all depends to go back and going back to Gabrielle's point, you know, who knows what else works and doesn't work. Um, and a lot of things have to work to make any constraint work, including an electoral commission for that matter. They are also almost always imperfect. So a bit of cynicism there, but also wondering whether one should take this idea and unpack it a bit and offer a sort of raft or menu of different things that might be able to slowly be edged into constitutional practice. Thank you very much. Um, very useful points. And, and I, I, that actually remind me of a point I wanted to ask uh, Professor Ramasse about as well. Um, how come, because the constitution says the, the Senate, the speaker, the president of the Senate actually becomes the interim president. But at the same time, the constitution also says the president appoints a the president of the Senate. Right. Um, so what was the thinking uh, be behind that? So basically, I think if I understand Christina, what she's saying is that um, we have to look uh, deeper into what kind of powers they have and also the, the, the arrangements in other respects, including, for instance, how um, the person who will succeed the president is appointed to make sure that the, the president does not actually exercise power through, through the back door. Professor Ramasse. Yeah, thank you for the questions. So what were the, the regime in 20, uh, 2010? I think they wanted to, to take the good practices of the former constitution of uh, 1992. And there was some opposition from the, some political actors because the, this constitution was uh, adopted uh, during the, the transition following the coup that happens on the, on March 2008. So they were not really accept the, the new constitution. Then there was a, the election in uh, the first election with that constitution was in uh, 2013, but it, there was not the, the resignation of the incumbent. It was only uh, during the last election in 2018. So I think the main uh, explanation was to take the good practices with the, the, the first constitution of the Third Republic. And uh, what we said about the president of uh, the Senate is not appointed by the, by the president of the Republic, but is elected by the, by the Senate. But the president of the Republic have to choose some members of the Senate and uh, of course, the, the president of the Senate will be um, uh, one of the appointees by the, the president of the Republic. And in, uh, he has choose someone who is uh, close to him. So it was the, the leader of his uh, political party. But before to, that we have this, uh, this change at the head of the, the states, there was a kind of, uh, of crisis in Madagascar in, uh, before the election because the government wanted to change the, some uh, electoral laws to, uh, to have better advantage and to have uh, a way to uh, manipulate the, the election. But I think it's a good thing to, uh, to have this kind of uh, proposition because uh, as we've seen in Madagascar, the, all the elections, so uh, when we look in uh, 2001, so there was an election following, followed by a electoral crisis during uh, six months. So I think it was one of also of the reason to reintroduce this provision in the new constitution. Th thank you very much. Um, no, we, we definitely think, you know, we, we don't propose its adoption, but I think it's an option um, that should be considered. And I think that that is what we're trying to do now, essentially making sure that we have multipliers of knowledge. And unfortunately we have essentially people from um, all, uh, what is called uh, long longitudes from all time zones, from Chile to, uh, to Hong Kong. Anna is with, with us as well. Anna, you, ha you had a question or did I, did I see the wrong name? Okay, now, so, so, that, so, um, so we still have three more minutes. If there's any um, very, very important question, we can take it. Um, otherwise, uh, Kimana, it's all over to you. 
Thank you very much again, especially, especially the panelists. Yeah, from my side, uh, Adam, all I have to say is a big thank you uh, to all of you for having, having made the time to join us in this webinar and to the fantastic panelists, as Adam was just saying, also to Adam for such engaging discussion. Um, we do still welcome any comments you may have on the draft uh, that my colleague Adam presented to you today. Um, and he sent via email and uh, we will review and update that note and share it with you as we upload it in, on, on our dedicated website, constitutionnet.org. Um, I hope you enjoyed the discussion and also hope to see you all very soon in our next constitutional design and innovations webinar. Um, and all uh, that would rest to say is uh, have a nice evening, afternoon or day ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Kimana. One more thing. If you think there are innovations that we are not picking up, because um, uh, like what, what we are hearing from Armenia sounds like really interesting stuff. Um, so if there are any ideas that you think we should cover, uh, hi, hi Harut, uh, th thank you for all the notes. So if there's anything uh, from all of you that you think we can, we can, um, we can uh, not promote or at least bring into light, we'll be very, we would be very grateful. Thank you very much again and a good day, good evening, um, good morning. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks so much.